I think the question, has China restored capitalism? Is China socialist? I think these questions are wrong uh, because they, they are in a way non-Marxist questions. Um, you know, what, what is a non-Marxist question? A non-Marxist question is, is something this or that? You know, uh, you want a direct answer. It's, it's what you might call the, uh, you know, uh, the kind of black and white, you know, yes, no, these binaries, you know, that, that's a one framing. I mean, the Marxist tradition is a different tradition. We believe human history takes place through a series of difficult contradictions between aspirations of people, their social relations, the forces of production that, you know, they inherit. These things are in a certain tension. Then there are inherited traditions. I mean, we have a historical materialism is a very rich tradition of understanding how change takes place, you know. Just because there's a revolution doesn't mean the next day there's communism. You know, th th that's not how it works. I mean, you know, uh, when the Soviet uh, Republic was formed, uh, the first, you know, 10, 15 speeches of the leadership that you can read, you know, whether it's not only Lenin, but the people who set up the medical thing, the children, they're all struggling. How do we create, how do we start a process of socialist construction? It's a process. It's not an event, you know. A revolution is both an event and a process, but socialist construction is a long process. And it's a process of debate because you're inheriting past institutions. You have to transform them. You're inheriting your limitations. I mean, why is it that all these revolutions happen in so-called backward countries, economically, you know, Russia, China, Vietnam, Cuba, Vietnam. I mean, country faced chemical warfare from the United States. Its agriculture was destroyed by napalm and by Agent Orange. And then now people ask, why isn't it socialist? Friends, you can't destroy a country's agriculture and then say, oh, well, they should have just collectivized. Wait a minute. The whole Ho Chi Minh Trail, can, you cannot grow anything there for a thousand years, maybe. You know, it's, you'll die if you eat that stuff. So one has to have a measure of patience, you know. And in China, there's been a series of debates over time. Uh, you know, not only within the communist movement, but others in, in the broader Chinese society debate what's the way forward. You know, if you look at the Chinese and the Soviet exp experience in the 1980s, they're very different experiences. See, what the Chinese uh, leadership learned, understood quickly, was technological change was happening very rapidly. Um, I mean, I, I remember reading the, the internal documents of the South Commission. Um, which was chaired by Julius Nyerere. And the uh, members who were on the commission from China uh, were very, very interested in how does technology and science transfer take place. You know, they understood that they were, let's use the old word, backward in science and technology, that they needed to learn about computerization and new forms of, you know, producing things and so on. The Russians, on the other hand, by the way, or the Soviets, had very advanced computer, you know, thing. But there was a sort of, there was a stasis. I mean, I don't want to get more into that because it's a, it's a long story. But in China, they understood we better learn this stuff because, you know, we cannot feed our people in this way. Now, there was a debate inside China. You know, some people believe let's advance the productive forces so that we can eventually transfer to socialism. That's a legitimate way to think about things. You know, you can't socialize poverty. You know, that's what happened in in uh, in in Cambodia, you know, that's not that is not a legitimate form of socialist construction. You know, where you take power and then you just say, "Well, we're poor, so now let's just divide poverty among all households." That is not acceptable to me as a, as a road. That's a romantic thing. You know, a romantic intellectual living in an apartment with a computer can romanticize about socializing poverty, but it's not acceptable. You cannot condemn people to illiteracy and starvation and say, "Let's." Everybody starve a little bit. No, that's not acceptable to me. So the question of advancing productive forces, it sounds harsh. Maybe I don't agree with you know, everything that is done, but I understand the argument is real. And inside China, there's an enduring argument about how far do you go? And you can see Hu Jintao, you know, Xi Jinping, every moment there is recalibration. You know, now we are seeing inequality getting too high. So we need more attention paid to the poor. This is a debate, you know. I mean, you, you, you would have to be uninterested in the fact that the Chinese people are both thinkers and they are political. 
you would have to think of that this is a kind of incipient racism. You're not interested in the fact that there is a debate in the Communist Party. You know, it's a very large party. Um, you know, I mean, there's millions of people there. And there's, there are factions and groups and they debate with each other. Um, Chen and Fu wrote a brilliant piece about the different schools of thought in China. You know, he's a senior uh, scholar of, in the Chinese Academy of, uh, you know, of Social Science, ran an institute in Shanghai, wrote a brilliant piece saying there's many schools of thought. There's even people, and he dismissed them, who are Jeffersonian liberals, you know, and he names them. These are the people. There are neoliberals, he says, in China. Yes, there are all these people. There are Maoists. There are, because there's a debate. And here's the irony, is that the Chinese intellectuals are telling you, we have debates. There are, there's a range of opinion. Some of them we don't agree with. From outside, they are saying there's no freedom of speech. So I don't get it, guys. I mean, either there's no freedom of speech or these Chinese intellectuals are lying. You know, that when they do debate in their own periodicals, now it's also true that there are some people whose opinions, society says, we don't, you know, we, we don't like your opinion, whatever. That's a different matter. You want to say, let's allow even more extreme opinions. You don't, you know, that's fine. But you can't say there's no freedom of speech. You know, you've got to understand how people are debating things. So I'm just saying that the question of, you know, if a, somebody in the West says to me, well, you know, China, they're, they're just a capitalist country. Well, you're entitled to your ill-informed opinion. But before you give that opinion, can you name for me, you know, two important debates that have taken place in, in Chinese society over the last three years? Do you know the names of five people in China who write about poverty? Uh, do you know what kind of poverty schemes there are? And now with COVID-19, why has the Chinese government and Chinese public actions, very key, socialism, not about the state alone. It's about neighborhood committees. It's about organizations, associations. Why is their reaction so different? How is it that in, you know, in one district, 440,000 people volunteered? You know, in advanced industrial countries, people don't know how to volunteer. You know, you get six people doing mutual aid. That's brilliant, beautiful. It's sensitive people who are out there feeling the homeless and so on. But 440,000 people volunteering in Kerala, four million, four and a half million women out of 17 million are in a co cooperative called Kudumbushri. They are out there feeding people, build, making masks, hand sanitizer. I mean, we need to, if you really question, oh, what socialism in Kerala? Look at the quality of public action. What socialism in China? Look at the quality of public action, the neighborhood committees, the volunteering. I mean, that the Communist Party, I mean, you, you may have seen the video of the doctors opening their masks, you know, and they were standing in a line. It's a charming video. One by one, they opened them up, like, you know, like ballet uh, dancers, you know, in a row or whatever. Um, if you look carefully, each one of them had the Communist Party lapel on. They were all Communist Party members. Now, the thing is that the party instructed their doctors, said, look, we prefer that you go there because you've made a commitment to serve the people. If, you, if there are non-Communist doctors who want to be there, they can be there. But if they want to leave, they're willing to leave. We will substitute with you because you are committed to serve the people. That's public action. The state didn't tell them to go there, by the way. This is the Communist Party. Now, I know some people will say the Communist Party is state identical. It's not true. It is not true. It's not identical. There are institutions in Chinese society which are outside the Communist Party. So let's look at it in a, in a much more, you know, I don't want to use the word balance, but realistic way. Not in this sort of stereotypical, you know, everything is top down, there's an emperor and, you know, I mean, there's a lot of hundred, two, three, four hundred years of stereotypes about China that sort of eclipse even the anti-communism. 